Good morning or good afternoon, folks. Sorry for the short delay there. We're, uh, we're ready to get started with our presentation today, bringing your sales process and methodology to life inside your CRM. Now, we've got 30 minutes for this particular webinar, so we're going to go fairly swiftly through the whole entire process. Uh, we will have both a presentation by Melissa Powers, we'll have a short demonstration, and we'll save time at the end for questions and answers. So my name's Tim Brayman. I run Corporate Strategy and Global Accounts for Revigy. Our premier speaker today is Melissa Powers. So Melissa's career started off in sales, where she was a, a top performer, and then from there she made the move into sales learning and development, and is now Director of Sales Enablement at McAfee and a Revigy customer. So, Melissa, without further ado, and since we're going to rock and roll through this process pretty fast, I'm going to turn things over to you and give you your first uh, and, uh, and, and get going into the presentation. I'm going to do two quick slides, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, Melissa. Now, Thanks, Tim. Now, what we see going on in the industry related to sales process and sales methodology is that companies make tremendous investments in things like Challenger, Solution Selling, Miller Hyman with the intent on driving business outcomes. And what we've noticed is that those programs, when well implemented, and when you actually make the behavior change, they actually deliver business value. So according to Aberdeen Group, and everybody will get a copy of both the slides and the presentation today, right? the quality or the, the effectiveness of your implementation of your methodology has a huge impact on business outcomes. Now, an enormous amount of this is based upon how well and how effectively, after the training event, we can make it stick. Now, many of you have seen things like the American Society of Training Development, the Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve. You know, we train people, and unless we make these new skills for the adult learners operational in less than 30 days, it starts to kind of leak out of their ears and they forget about it. So what we're trying to figure out and what we're proposing here is a method or a way with some best practices and somebody who's actually done it to make it stick, how do you leverage technology to drive that behavior change that then results in consistent execution at the highest level and then delivers on measurable results from the implementation of your methodology? And so that's all I'm going to do to set things up, and I'm going to turn it over now to you, Melissa, so that you could start talking about your process and what you did at McAfee. Thank you, Tim. And why don't you go ahead and advance to the next slide and we'll get right into it. So just to give you guys a little background, and if you're looking at methodologies, you may relate to some of what I'm saying. Um, although McAfee had an extensive, has an extensive portfolio, when we started looking at this, you know, we were known as an AV company and we needed to expand that and get people to understand what value a security platform would bring you. We had sales reps that were really great at renewing, but not no necessarily focusing on winning net new logos. You know, it became feature knife fights as opposed to solving the customer problems. And so we really wanted to align with the buyer's journey and their process versus just focusing focusing on the sales process. We needed to improve our executive conversations because that's where the ultimate decision to go to a platform resided instead of best in breed. And we wanted to, you know, we had great successful reps, but we didn't have a predictable, repeatable process. And so that was kind of the underlying situation and the opportunity that it afforded us. And Tim, if you'll go to the next slide. The other thing, as we began to research, we looked at uh, Forrester and Gartner and, you know, what are customers saying they wish salespeople were doing? And, you know, they were tired of salespeople just talking about the feature benefits. They wanted salespeople to show that they understood their business. And those that crafted that buying vision vision one even in a very competitive marketplace and that was backed up by our own um, net promoter scores and that you know our customers wanted us to understand that to show that we understood their business more 
We interviewed our leaders. We got to about 95% of all sales leaders to find out what do our best reps do so that we could ensure, you know, everybody typically has the a top 5 to 10%, and then you've got that middle 60%. So we wanted to document what does that top percentage do and get that 60% to do it. And then when we looked at our own win-loss data, it was clear that when we engage high and have those executive conversations come in early in the process so that we can understand the problems and paint the buying vision and map those our value to their ch the customer's challenges, we win consistently. If you'll go ahead, Tim. And so we set out to build our own methodology. The bottom pre-qualified, qualified solution to find technical win, that will show you our sales process as it was reflected in Salesforce. And so we looked at a buying process or buyer's journey, and we started right now with just a standard, you know, industry best practice for technology buys and align those two and then in the middle is where we built our methodology and the methodology is made up of skills process techniques and tools and we decided to build our own because what we found when you buy off the shelf is that it may hit one of these stages and be famous for having a technique or something within one of these stages, but we, there was none that addressed what a rep should do in all of the stages. And this is the opportunity management piece, and then we knew we needed to incorporate account planning and territory planning. If you'll go ahead, Tim. Um, we, we knew this was gonna be a lot of change, and so, we started out and we engaged Revigy very early in the process. And it's one of the things I appreciate them, about them as a partnership is that we were, we thought we had mapped out something really large and narrowed it down to biteable chunks. And we went round and round with Tim specifically and about, he thought we were doing too much we didn't care we needed to do what we were doing and the further we got in the process the more we acknowledged they were right and the narrow the more narrow our scope became on, on what we would measure and reinforce um, we you know we felt like we couldn't launch only a piece of the process we needed to show them the whole story from beginning to end but we narrowed the scope on what we would measure and what we would really drill down on for a period of time. Um, and that was more in the opportunity planning piece because the things we picked were the top things that the sales leader said that our reps needed to be better at to have a direct positive impact on their business. So we felt that would be harder for them to argue with, and therefore we could get more adoption and wins faster. Um, but, but what we knew, having been at companies when I was in sales and had a methodology shoved down my throat or having done it here on a couple of occasions, everybody has the best intentions of yeah, that's great, I need to do that, but then reality hits when they get back into their daily routine and they forget. And so that's where the Revigy tool set came in and finding ways where we could use the tools to reinforce and remind them of what they'd learned and what they agreed would help have a positive impact on their business. And one of our keys was let's keep it simple, right? We don't want to add an hour's worth of time for every tool that we pick for sales to use. And the Revigy tools helped us do that. And then we continually drive home the value these bring to the sales reps and the sales leaders. Go ahead, Tim. Sure. 
Um, now, clearly, we had challenges, um, and there were some things that, you know, we learned after the fact worked really well for us. I'd like to say we did all those things that worked well because we knew they would work well, but um, we were kind of just lucky in some of those. We, we had good executive sponsorship. The truth is the the sales leadership asked us to build a method. They asked to implement a methodology. We sold them on building our own. Um, because sales enablement is part of sales ops and they own change management and sales force, we were all in the same family and then we brought in IT and having us all together working on a team proved to be um, very beneficial in the initial rollout, but then also in the um, mitigating any challenges that we ran into. And we did run into some. We had the sales leaders and reps engaged early, so any tool that we rolled out, a sales representative had participating in scoping out what that was going to look like. I mentioned that we engaged Revigy, uh, you know, initially we engaged them truthfully just to validate what we'd already done. So I don't know about y'all's companies, but at ours, if somebody that we paid a lot of money to outside of the company says it's good, then the people inside the company believe it. Um, and and the, the side benefit of that was we learned a great deal in the consulting time on how to communicate what it was we were going to do, what some best practices were just from rolling out a methodology. And as I mentioned early, they really helped keep us focused on not doing too much at one time. Another key thing was doing it in a phased approach and making sure that we weren't sending out more than the sales reps could bite off and then gaining frontline accountability. Uh, from a challenge perspective, we had only had Salesforce implemented for a year, and so the usage was not high, and we were going out trying to get them to use these tools, and it became obvious the only reason they were going into Salesforce was to use these tools, and that was not a compelling enough reason. So we had to kind of back up and increase Salesforce usage in general. At the time we started this, we were Intel, and we used Intel's IT, Intel's finance, Intel's HR, all their supporting functions. And so in the middle of our rollout, we spun out and became McAfee again and had to build up all those functions. So it was a lot of change happening at the same time, which, as you can imagine, created competing priorities. And then as we began to do, we, a core piece of our methodology is Challenger. And um, we knew we had relationship salespeople, but it wasn't until we were standing in classes trying to get them to embrace the whiteboard and some of the things that we were proposing that it became very apparent what a barrier those relationship sales people were going to be to adoption. And we still struggle with sales and marketing alignment and getting the messaging to match um, the methodology and the way we are teaching salespeople now to have conversations. But we drilled down on the value map, the influencer map, and the qualification scorecard, although we did roll out all the components of an opportunity plan. And that has been instrumental in our adoption. Within three months, we got to about 50%. And within nine months, we were at 70%, 60 to 70%. And we, and we seem to be stuck there. Um, and it, a big contributor was one, we had what we called scrum calls with managers, where after they came to class, we would bring them on, and there was three or four questions we would ask them that made them uncomfortable if they weren't adopting it and helped us learn what we could change. And then we ran dashboards on the tool usage and went to executive calls, and it was just, 
the executive was either red, green, or yellow. And over time, they didn't like being red, and that really pushed the adoption. <laughs> yeah. yep. So, you know, that's a quick 12 minutes worth of overview of a probably a 12 month process. But um, that's kind of what's been going on with us over the last 12 months. Thanks, so, Melinda, Tim. I think I you're going to show them a demo, right? Yeah, I'm going to show them a demo, but first I'm going to tell everybody what a great job you did, right, which was make sure we did have that executive leadership make sure that was leading the way, make sure the frontline managers were actually making it operational, making it stick, and then, you know, doing it in bite-sized chunks. So yeah. my congratulations to you. Um, everybody, we're going to do a short demonstration, and then we're going to do some questions after this. But as we started off, we showed Melissa's um, uh, the McAfee buying process. This, right so this is their sales process aligned with the customer journey all right so most people start with this as your training point right you train your people in this or maybe you've got a visualization that looks like this right a buyer aligned sales process so the buyer stages the sales stages key activities verifiable outcomes all those key elements that make up your sales process and then the tools that you use in the journey and I'm going to jump over and everybody on your screen should be seeing Salesforce.com, right? And so, you know, Revigy, we're agnostic to the CRM. It could be Salesforce or Microsoft or SAP or Oracle. But in all of those applications, you go look at a sales process, and this is what it looks like. And frankly, that bears no resemblance to what we just taught everybody. And if we're trying to drive behavior change and make something stick and consistent in execution, we really need to be able to, in every single opportunity, visually bring our sales process to life. And so we're looking at a sales opportunity for the big data project that's going to close in June for a million seven. And wouldn't it be nice if we actually visually represented the process that we've trained everybody on inside the tools that they're using for CRM. And then as part of CRM and part of each stage, you see your sales stages across the top. You see key activities that we're supposed to perform in each one. We see our verifiable outcomes that indicates the clients aligned with us and even coaching interjections. But one of the first things if you're looking at a challenger model is a persona-based provocation. So let's say we're going to have a, a first call on a VP of customer care. Wouldn't it be nice if we had just-in-time performance support that said for that VP of customer care, here's the provocation, here's the reframe, here's the rational drowning that you should be using. How about we serve up the reinforcement and the tools at the point in time when they're needed to everybody so they don't have to go hunting around, sending out emails to who's got the latest PowerPoint presentation, hunting through SharePoint or something for the latest decks, et cetera. So that's an example of a tool, right? Is that bringing you the persona-based provocation? Challenger also has this concept of a scorecard which says, how well does this particular opportunity meet our ideal customer profile? And wouldn't it be nice, right, if we could just answer a series of questions here, related, you know, in this case, these are challenger-related questions, and get an overall visualization of how well aligned this particular sales opportunity is with what we consider to be ideal. Now, what you're seeing here is a representation of, of challenger method, but it doesn't make any difference if it's Challenger or Solution Selling or Miller Hyman or Richardson or any of a number of things. You know, Revigy is going to give you that ability to visually bring your method to life. Now, another key tenet of every sales methodology is really understanding the who's who in the zoo. Who are the players that we're trying to engage with? And wouldn't it be nice if the solution actually represented, you know, the green people who like us, the red people who don't, the yellow people are neutral, and the gray people we've never spoken to. Something like this is far more powerful in terms of driving critical thinking and coaching than just simply a list of contact roles in an organization. And the concept behind Revigy is not just to bring these tools to life visually, but also still that just-in-time performance support. So, for example, one of the things in Challenger customers to understand the mobilizer. Well, wouldn't it be nice if while we're going through this process to identify the mobilizer, I could click a button and get access to the things that tell me how do I understand what a mobilizer is, right? Now, I'm showing you some public, some information from uh, CEB around Challenger and mobilizer. 
Revigy is not providing challenger selling or challenger training. We don't provide any intellectual property. I'm just showing you how you can use our technology to link to your tools and your intellectual property. And in this case, the example is challenger. Perhaps when you've done your training for your teams, you may have actually done perhaps a video. You want to record some of your internal people giving a best practice three to five minute pitch on how to find out who a mobilizer is. So this is that example of just-in-time performance support. As you're in the middle of actually executing, right, your sales process, and as you go through and execute your sales process, whether it's challenger, solution selling, or what have you, Revigy is supporting you at each step of the way to drive that behavior change. Because we all know that if we change people, and you know, too often we, we do a dip the sheep approach. We bring everybody in for training at sales kickoff, and then next year we'll bring them in and we'll train them again. We've got to drive behavior change to get measurable results. Now the last part of this that I'll show is how do we take this, you know, we're still looking at a single opportunity inside Salesforce. How can I bring this visually to life for the management team? All right, so you've got a methodology which is challenger or something else, right? Wouldn't I like to apply that method, my way of selling? And for McAfee, for them, it was a combination of challenger and other methodologies, so they, they built their hybrid methodology. How do you visually bring your pipeline to life and show me where the risk has been inserted based upon our methodology? So we see here these boxes. These boxes are deals. Big boxes are big deals, little boxes are little deals. And the color indicates the risk. And so we had just been looking at the big data project. Let's take a look at that. And what we can see is that based upon the qualification scorecard, this particular opportunity is only marginally qualified. Well, you know what? I probably need to either fix some of these things or get it out of the pipeline. If I look at the relationship map that we just looked at, there's an awful lot of really important people, decision makers and approvers, who are going to vote for the competition. How do we get those people to neutral? And then the other thing that's fairly common is if you've got a buyer's journey, what you're looking for is alignment between your sales process and the buying process. And what we can see represented here is that the buyer is still way back early in the journey, but the salesperson has progressed this opportunity all the way through to stage four. So we've got misalignment between the seller, who's potentially got some happy years, and where the buyer is in their journey. And so that's the idea that Revigy is trying to bring to life for you, is to take your method, your way, whether it's something you purchased directly from a methodology vendor like Challenger or Solution Selling, or you've built your own, or you've got a combination of the two, how do you bring the methodology to life to guide the teams to consistent behavior change and then make the measurable results uh, obvious. And then we can actually gain the results that we expect from the methodology. Now, at this point, I'm gonna go and take a pause and we're gonna start asking the audience what kind of questions that they all have. And uh, one of the first questions we've got, Melissa, I'm gonna throw over the wall to you. So the first question it says is, you know, hey, we have salesforce.com. You know, why did you feel you needed technology to support your new sales process, your new sales method? So for us, Salesforce is great at tracking opportunities, but there was no way to visualize the methodology and to keep the steps that we wanted a rep to do at each phase or each stage of the sales cycle in front of them so they could remember what they were supposed to do or to continually keep in front of them the buyer's journey so that we can begin to get them to think, you said you're moving, but is the buyer moving with you? And Revigy allowed us to do that. Okay, great. Now, <clears throat> the, um, on your slide, you mentioned also, um, Melissa, territory planning and account planning. How do those relate to what we're, we're talking today related to opportunity? We haven't really embraced territory planning yet, and that's a lot of internal problems. But from an account planning perspective, um, it's critical that we have a standard way we do account planning and then a standard account plan. And the visualization of what's going on in an account we could get from Revigy and the 
data it gives a sales manager so that they can manage those account plans in their business, those were key components to rolling out the account planning piece of it. That, does that answer the question, Tim? Yep, yep, it does. Now, there's a couple of other questions. We're actually, we're getting a lot of questions from people, so this is really awesome. So when you're creating, Melissa, I'm going to throw this one out to you. So the specific question is, is the source for customer side decision makers in that relationship map, is that created by the rep or is that created by LinkedIn or Ubers? How is it that you at McAfee decide, you know, who's the decision maker on a deal? It's created by the rep. Okay. Now, do you have any guidelines or coaching or, or inspection that you go through to make sure that we've, we've identified them? Yes. So our managers know typically what who d makes the decision in our deals. And so by seeing the visualization and who the rep thinks it is, they can question, do we have the, the right decision makers? And very often we're finding we might have one of them, but there's typically three or four and the other three or four are not identified. And that gives us a quick look into that. Okay. So the other one, um, and Melissa, what are the other questions that we've got? is what kind of data is needed for this to work? The, the person saying that we have Salesforce.com, but the quality of our data isn't great. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to leave that to you to talk a little bit about data quality and what data is necessary and how you guys drive good results. Well, I'll see your bad data and raise you horrible data. And <laughs> it, has not, <laughs> it has not prevented us from getting adoption. It has slowed us down, but the visibility and the importance of the adoption of the sales methodology is forcing faster correction on the data issue. So we have a hierarchy problem. Um, we have, if somebody on our company owns Boeing, they might have 200 versions of Boeing. And so how do they know where to put all this data? Um, and so, by getting that visibility, we've come up with some solutions, but in the class when we first rolled this up, we just had them pick a favorite, and that's where we began to build it. And then we have some issues with other systems feeding Salesforce with bad contact data. And there were some cool things in Revigy that helped us get around that, because if a, a contact was in the wrong account, if I own both through Revigy, I could find them and still build my map. And so that was another selling feature to the sales reps on why they should be using the influencer map. So I hear you on the bad data, but we were still able um, to get, to push the strong adoption and it's beginning to help us get the visibility and resources we need to go fix the other problem. You know, Ms. Melissa, that, that was a great. I think part of it also lends to your implementation, right? Type, chunk, take yeah. it up in bite-sized chunks, right? If you go to people immediately and say, I need all the information related to an account or an opportunity, that's just too much. Their heads start to explode. So by, yes. by chunking it up, you can focus on specific areas and get good quality data there, right, uh, uh, through the process. All right. Um, Melissa, here's another question for you. And it says, what type of resources were needed to drive first the imp implementation and then the governance, ongoing governance in your organization? And how many FTEs were there? Well, so I have 31 people in my org, but probably 10 work on it consistently. I have one. Is that, is that you think what they're asking, Tim? Well, kind of, I, I think you're, talk, you're talking more about the training and uh, for the whole organization. You know, how many people were were involved in the implementation? Oh, okay. What, what kind, so, kinds of people? Yeah, so our Salesforce people, the people who manage Salesforce and implemented Salesforce, I think we have three or four of them and maintain Salesforce, the admins of Salesforce. And then we had a couple of the IT people um, from uh, – IT perspective, the sandbox, and, I, and everyone that was part of that was amazed at how quickly and easily it was to implement the Re Revigy tools. I mean, it kind of reminds me of downloading an app on my phone, but you're downloading the app to Salesforce. 
Yeah. It was shockingly simple. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is I think the thing that I got a lot of times is, is this is not an IT project. While we do need some people to plug in at Salesforce.com, et cetera, this is much more a business methodology project than it is yes. an IT project. Would you, would you speak yes. to that a little bit, Melissa? Yeah, that that is absolutely the case. And, and I think the IT people involvement was more control because it's a system in our infrastructure uh, yeah. versus the heavy lifting. And they and yeah. our organization, IT, owns the data. And so you've got some syncing back and forth. And so they had to get involved in that. Okay. Um, so there's another question that's just come in here, Melissa, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of trying to interpret it. It says, okay, we need to drive this methodology in a very large enterprise uh, with large, uh, large customers when we've got large customer account teams. So some of maybe the initial steps are already done uh, in the process, you know, and then the question goes on to say, what, what do you need to do to drive the business outcomes? So I guess the question is really, you know, is it okay to step into kind of the middle of the process, right, for in the early when you first deploy it, and then once you've deployed it, how do you how do you kind of make it stick? What are the key things that are driving the outcomes? Well, for us making it stick, it, it's it really is the squeaky wheel gets the grease and just keeping it in front of them and continually working with the VPs and the RDs from a reminder and coaching perspective on how this can help them drive their business and we started with sales and now we're beginning ours are also being used in large enterprises and now we're beginning to bring on the other pieces of an account team like a systems engineer and professional services but we wanted to get traction with the sales organization so they led the charge as opposed to one of the other organizations Okay. Do you think we answered the question? I hope so. Okay. And if not, if, if anybody else has questions and we didn't get to your question, please just uh, send us an email um, or, uh, or, or we'll go through the questions and make sure we did answer everything. But everybody who attended today will get a copy of the presentation and the video. You can respond back to us and we'll try and uh, provide clarifications or additional answers uh, if need be. We've actually gone just a little bit over our time. So at this point, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Melissa, for your time. and My expertise. pleasure. And uh, we'll have to do this again in another three to four months. It's always fun to work with you, Melissa. Thanks a lot. I love doing them. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Like I said, you'll get an email with a link to uh, the recording of this particular video within the next two to three days. Uh, and in the meantime, if any questions arise that you need urgent answers to, don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we're happy to provide that. Thanks. Everybody have a great rest of your week.